um, and the programme is leading up to. So BBC Novels um, have created the 100 um, top novels um, chosen by some celebrities. Um, and we've decided to do a programme um, celebrating these books. Um, and we have always wanted to do a games jam. Um, and so we've themed um, our programme on this. And so if you want to get involved and you can, please do create a game um, if you want to. And the Games Jam will be held on Saturday, the 24th and the 25th of April. What we're asking you to do is create a game. And this can be a board game, a digital game, an escape game, a card game, tabletop, whatever you fancy, whatever you're into. Um, and then submit it to us on those dates. Um, and that's the themed on one of the books or one of the themes of the BBC novels that shaped our world. And so if you visit our blog, which I'm just showing you here, and Rianne is going to put you put in chat for us, um, and that will tell you everything that you need to know on there. And we've also got a fantastic programme of events, as you can see on screen at the moment, including today's, which is Cards or Die. Um, Another highlight, which I'm very much looking forward to, is stepping into Narnia with our VR artist, Rosie Summers. And so she's taking inspiration um, from the book and she's going to draw with Tilt Brush a live kind of Narnia for us to be able to step into on a Zoom call as well. We've picked four of our favourite themes from the BBC novels list and they are Adventure, Life, Death and Other Worlds, Rule Breakers, and crime and conflict. And today we're gonna to be focusing on adventure on there. Rianne has created a lovely collection um, of images from our archives and collections. And they are all in the different themes that we've chosen as well. So they might act as inspiration for the games that you choose. And then we've got the rules as well. I won't go into those at the moment. You can see those when you join up. Um, but the good news is you can win 150 quid if you are the winning um, game creator or 50 quid for the runners up as well. Um, and we've also listed lots of useful resources um, that you can use. And we're very grateful to our sponsors, um, the BBC, and um, Libraries Connected and the Arts Council as well for making that happen. Okay, so I think I've said anything I need to say there. Um, what I'll do now is I'll just introduce you um, to who else is with me, and I should probably introduce myself. <laughs> it's the day before a bank holiday. So I'm Claire Duffield, I'm Digital Engagement Librarian from Leeds Libraries. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Rianne Isaac, who is the collections manager as well. Um, and we are very, very happy to have Anne Jones with us today, who's gonna to show us some of the game mechanics, um, particularly around the theme of adventure today in cooperative games. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and let Anne take over. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, Hi. brilliant to see so many people, fantastic. Um, so, like Claire said, I'm just going to talk to you a bit about um, a couple of adventure games and have a little little bit of a look at those. Um, before I do that, you've all been sent a workbook. Um, there's no pressure whatsoever <laughs> to fill that in or do it. It was just a series of things that I thought you might find useful to reflect on and think about when you're designing your game, just to kind of get you started and get you thinking and asking some questions about what you want out of your game. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're starting with cooperative games. Um, I'm aware that people will be at different levels of board gaming. Some of you probably play loads of board games. Some of you probably don't play so many. Um, so I'm sorry if it's if I tell you things that you already know. So um, cooperative games. You might have heard of examples like Pandemic is a really popular one. You might have heard of that. Um, Forbidden Desert. There's Forbidden Island and Forbidden Sky, Magic Maze. They're all quite popular cooperative games. 
the basic premise of a cooperative game is that you play together against the game. So instead of your traditional kind of competitive games, it's a game where you work as a team to outwit or undo the puzzle of the game. Um, they have co some common features. So I thought I would just talk you through some of those. So one of the common features is that you play together against a puzzle, against the game itself or a situation. And often it seems like you're trying to escape from something um, or, you know, get away or find treasure and escape, that sort of theme. Um, each character usually has a special ability. There's often a medic that has restorative powers so that when one of you inevitably falls down a well or breaks your leg, the medic can come to your aid and help you. Um, and they'll each character will have a skill that's specific to the challenges in the game. For example, in Forbidden Desert, you have one person that can carry extra water because one of the challenges is keeping hydrated in that game. Um, there's always limitations in cooperative games, things like not being able to share your knowledge or share cards with one another. Um, and that usually kind of makes it a bit more challenging and a bit more strategic. Um, there are also extra events, usually event cards that you turn over at certain triggers. So it might be at the end of each person's go, you turn over a set number of cards. Those event cards are usually quite nasty and often that will increase as you go through the game so at the end you know of maybe round one the number of cards that you turn over will go up to three or four and it'll go up and up and make it more difficult um often in cooperative games once one person dies or fails the mission you all lose but there are other games like um forest of fate that i'm going to show you in a moment and um, Subterra, where actually you can finish the game still, you just, there's, there's like a penalty, like a score penalty. So although you want everyone to finish together, you don't have to all finish. So that's, you know, that's something to think about if you're making a cooperative game. Do you want it that everyone wins or no one wins, which gives it a quick end then to the game, or you get that situation where you've got one person that's out of the game essentially and the rest of the team are carrying on. So it's up to you really to have a little think about that. Forest of Fate has a really interesting way around that. So I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and then there are challenges built into the mechanics of the game. So things like um, pieces or events that move against the characters. So for instance, in uh, Forbidden Desert, the sand builds up and when you run out of sand, you die. Um, and often in cooperative games, there tends to be a lot of lose conditions. Like usually you open your rule book and you're like, oh, how do I win? And it says, you, you do this and you win. Cooperative games, it's always like, oh, run out of sand, you're dead. Lose one of the members of your party, you're all dead. Run out of water, you're dead. So there's, like, there's, like, there's always like this huge list of ways to fail, which is quite always quite amuses me about cooperative games but I quite I kind of like that because then I view it as a bit of a challenge and I'm like yes I'm going to do this <laughs> so yeah so just some things to think about specifically tonight I've chosen some choose your own adventure games to look at um the the idea is that they they take you on this adventure together and it's just it just ties in with those adventurous novels and the idea that there's some sort of quest or some sort of adventure to go on um, so the first one I'm going to look at is Forest of Fate and I'm going to move my camera <laughs> so this yeah let's see how this goes um, right so I hope no one feels seasick ah there we go so if I can just do that where's the actual right so Forest of Fate I might just hire it up a bit actually trying to work out where the there we go so in forest of fate you've got this kind of sorry this winding path of cards okay that takes you on your adventure I've only put out a little path that's the finishing post so I've just put out a little post but um the idea of the game is you adventure through the forest of fate 
and best case scenario is that you all survive all of the challenges and then you get to the finishing post and you can see on the finishing post oh it's flipped isn't it <laughs> uh not for us oh Oh, good. Yeah, it's all, it's all fine, don't worry. <laughs> oh, good, it's flipped for me, how weird. Right, oh, thank you, Flo. <laughs> so you can see one survived, some survived, and all survived. And you've got a different outcome there, depending on that, and depending on how many points you accrue through the game. Okay, so that's right at the end. I've started at the end. But the first thing that you do is you choose your character. I really like this game because I always describe it as like D&D &D light. So people who are quite interested in playing Dungeons and Dragons, but maybe don't know someone who's like skills or, or knowledgeable enough to run a campaign. This is quite a nice way into it because it's got all the characters and you can you can add to the characters as much as you like and you can get into character as much as you like as well. So you've got the shaman, you've got the bard, the sorcerer, the ranger, the warrior, and the thief. Now, I will say one of the downsides of this game, which you want to avoid, is this business of colour. So those two players have different colours. Now, to me, that is not clear enough. So colour is something that you want to think about when you're making your game components and you're, you're making your game. Just, just think about making sure that it's dead clear. So we're going to look at the shaman's character. Each character, like I said, has special skills. So in this game, the skills are divided into these categories. So you've got style, you've got speed, you've got guile, you've got wits, you've got force, and you've got care, okay? So as a team, you put forward one person that's gonna deal with the challenge. And you do that by deciding which skill area you're gonna to use to face the challenge. So you might meet a band of thieves and you decide, right, we're gonna use wits. So you look on the card and you're like, right, so the shaman has got great wits. So the shaman's a good person to go forward and fight that. The other thing you wanna think about is your life points. And these have got, I thought when I got this game that this was really clever. It's got this little heart. I don't know if you can see the little heart. And it points to your life points. So your life points are on here with your special ability. And your life points go down like this. Now, I was saying how great I thought this was. And the guy who made it, Phil, said to me they've had loads of dreadful feedback about this because it's too fiddly. So... Yeah, it's just something I've not thought about. If, you, if you're not so dexterous, it can get, just get really frustrating and really annoying, actually. So he was saying better to have just a little clip on the top there that you can slide along. So in terms of components as well, it's thinking about things like that, isn't it? Accessibility and making sure that as many people as possible can play your game. So, yeah. So the shaman has got this ability. You get a choice of two abilities in this game, which is nice because it's, it gives you options and you can play it differently each time. So in this one, the shaman, I always pick this ability, which is second sight. The previous encounter happened only in a vision. Rewind all its costs, then play that encounter again, this time choosing a safer path. And it costs two life points to use. So, just by using it you're going down two life points but when i show you the game you'll see why that's that's acceptable it's quite a brutal game to be honest um so you've got your character and you're going to set off on your quest you have a starting point for your quest so there's like six different starting points to choose from we've got mount shimon and that comes with, each one comes with an artifact or an item. And the item that we've got is the Staff of Conjuration, which says you can instantly gain any item required to bypass the current encounter. I'll explain what that means in a minute. But yeah, so you start with a quest and there's a variety of those. So one of the strengths of this game is it's got loads and loads of variety in it. 
Okay, so there's loads of ways of replaying it time and time again. So you've got your two different abilities to choose from. That gives it some variety. And then you've got your quests. Okay. So the path that we're on, the way it works is each card has, sorry if I'm making you a bit seasick, each card has four sets of numbers on it. Okay, so the way that you go into the card dictates which set of numbers you use. So like this next card here, we would use the hunter. We would use the numbers on this side. And when we go into this card here, we'll use the numbers on the top. So each card, depending on which way up it lands in your spread, has got four different possible ways of playing it as well, which I think is super clever because it means it just gives the game that replayability. Okay, so we've got our first encounter was coming in this way and it's called middle of the pack. You come to a sudden halt as a snarling emanates from the undergrowth. Out in front of you leaps a vicious wolf followed by two more behind. Their jaws are dripping and their eyes are fixed menacingly upon you. So we've now got some choices to make as a team. So we can use our staff of conjuration because here it says you can bypass it using the flaming torch. So we can choose to just not deal with this, but it means losing the Staff of Conjuration, which if you can see there is worth 10 victory points if we can hang on to it. So because we're all quite hardy adventurers, we would of course choose to fight the wolves, yeah? Or not necessarily fight, maybe use our care or our wits, okay? So the choices we have got are, because we went in this way, we've got a choice of, guile okay so we've got guile that we can use there we've got speed there we've got care there and then the last one we've got force so those are our four choices so do you want to like type in which skill you think we should use and i will tell you the story of what happens so we've got force which is fairly obvious basically we can, uh, we can use our brute strength. We can take care, so pay attention to details and take your time, act with caution and vigilance. We've got speed, peg it basically, just run as fast as you can away from those wolves. And we've got guile. This one says, nobody else plays fair, so why should you? You'll lie, cheat and steal to gain the upper hand. And when all else fails, you can always try hiding. So let's see what we've got in the chat and see which one we're going for. Speed, car, car, guile. Oh, a lot of people are saying guile. Guile. Right, I'm going to go with guile because they were the quickest to answer. So what happens is you, it comes also with this book. Okay, the storytelling, you can see it's quite worn. I've played it a lot and it gets played a lot at my events. I run uh, board game events and people love this game. So what you do is you look on your card from the way you came in, I should say, and Guile is 110. Okay, so we're going to turn to page 110, uh, number 110 in the book. Okay, and then you can see there under 110, you read that little bit out and then it's got four choices depending on your skill level. So it says you stoop to the ground and take up a fistful of dry earth as the beasts circle closer. Wait for it, wait for it. And then you choose fair, good, great or epic. Now this is where, when I read you the shaman's special ability, it probably didn't make that much sense. But what you can do now is, oh, someone says they're loving this game. That's lovely. <laughs> what you can do now is sometimes you read this first bit in the book and it's very cleverly written because sometimes you read it and you're like, oh, no, we're all going to die. So when you read this, 
it's like you can use your second sight and you can be like, oh, it's all right. It was just a vision. Let's choose a different skill. So you can go back and choose a different skill. But actually, let's just press on. We're, we're right at the start. We're on full health. OK, so we've got great uh, good guile. So that means we go to number 1001 in our Choose Your Own Adventure book. Anne? Yeah? Hello, it's Claire. Um, do you have like a focus um, on your camera? Because it's a little bit out of focus for us to see. Is I it? Got, yeah, I don't know. If, oh, if okay. there's nothing you can do, it's fine. because you're called distance, isn't it? Yeah, you're describing it really well if there's nothing you can do, but Can yeah. you read that or is that too small? No, I can't read it. It's, it's a bit blurred. Is it better further away? Yeah, I've got terrible eyesight. <laughs> I can't. Um, it is better further away, I think, but it's still a bit blurred. But don't worry okay. if you can't do anything to focus it because you're describing it really well. Yeah. What I'll do is when I get to the end of this game, while I'm setting the next one up, I'll have a fiddle with it and see if I can get it. Um, yeah. That's yeah, fine, I yeah. Can't yeah. Say don't worry. Way. Don't worry. Just thought yeah, I do also think we might get eaten, Izzy. <laughs> You're probably quite right. So. Oh, OK. Right. Now. Just as the leader pounces, you cast the dust into its eyes. It howls pitifully and retreats to the bushes, its brethren in tow. So we'd made it through. <laughs> so then you turn over the next one and you carry on your adventure. So the next one would be the hunter and you can bypass it using your four legged friend. Sometimes what happens when you read out the the. Um, event sorry forgot the word the event is it'll say um like with that one if we'd been like caring towards the wolves it might say gain four-legged friends and one of the wolves comes with you then on your adventure and so then you look through there's a pile of artifacts and a pile of items and you look through those and you take the one that that it says in the book the other thing that can happen is if something bad happens to you, not only do you lose life points, and it really is quite brutal. I stepped in a hole once and like twisted my ankle and lost five life points. And I was like, five, five. It's merely a flesh wound. So you can become exhausted. You can become reckless. And these take your abilities down by one. So again, it's another level of like, just, just adding to it all the time. On the plus side, you can become vigilant, which adds to your care, or you can become composed, which gives you extra guile. And that's where, you know, in the book where it said epic. So it says you can be fair, good, great or epic. You can only get up to epic if you've got one of these and you can only go down to fair if you've got one of those. OK, so. I think that's about, oh no, I know what I've forgotten to tell you. So you know before when I was saying about um, like the, the downside of having a game where it, the win condition isn't everybody wins is that you can have one person that's just not playing anymore. So they're like out. This game, you can choose to become like a malevolent spirit that you're like angry with the rest of your party for leaving you in the forest of fate. And so on the flip side of your special ability, there's a ghost power and you can use your ghost power to mess up the rest of the party, which I think is a really nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the spirit option is brilliant because it means that you're still in the game, but it also encourages you to look after the rest of your party because you let someone die then they can come back as a vengeful spirit. So I think that's a really nice, and, and again, lends to that kind of storytelling element of it, doesn't it? It's kind of, you know, yeah, it's part of the story and your character. And like I say, people get quite engrossed in it and like take on the characters and get quite involved. It's a really nice, it's a really nice game, really popular. But I think also it's got some quite unusual mechanics. Did anyone want to ask me any questions? Ah, best play account. Yeah. So it's one of those games that plays two to six. Yeah, it plays two to six, but it's not as good fun with two. 
what we ended up doing was playing two characters and I'm not I'd rather if a game plays three or four that it just said you know on the play account I think just say just say it plays three or four for me this is better with like four people it's brilliant with six really good with three um and it's it's all right with two but it's just not quite as good so yeah yeah okay any other questions generally or about the game or we're all all right okay so um i'll just bob that up there so that i'm not talk to you um the second game i was gonna oh how long does it usually take um about about an hour and again if it's six people it can take like an hour and ten an hour and quarter um if it's two or three it's shorter um and also um yeah it it can be quite short if you're really unlucky like we've had brutally short <laughs> games of it and then other times we've been a bit luckier it's gone on a bit longer um yeah the characters are really distant i'll try and show you one up to the um yeah that's one of the things i like about it because you can't tell the gender of the of many of the characters occasionally you can but they're either pretty androgynous when you can see their faces or they're so distant that they're kind of and dark as well. So they're quite mysterious looking. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice way around that because it can be anyone. Because I think that's one of the things I'm going to say about the next game that we're going to look at. It's um it's quite gender um balanced. But um not so much in anything else um so yeah were there any other questions everyone all right okay so the next game i was going to show you is called tales of evil and you can see straight away that's a much bigger bigger box this one takes about an hour to play but it's composed of several chapters so this is a bit different to Forest of Fate. Um, let me just check that I'm not missing anything out. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, this one is, is um, still choose your own adventure, but a little bit different really. Um, it's, it's an 80s themed adventure game, a little bit Stranger Things. A lot of the characters remind me of characters in Stranger Things. Um, and I think that's been a big sales point really for it. Um, it's much more involved than Forest of Fate. There's loads more details and there's loads more components. So I won't go into the same depth with this one because it can be a bit overwhelming. And I know certainly when our first playthrough we were like, what does this bit do? Why have we got this bit? There's so many bits to it, do you know what I mean? Um, but what I was going to say, it's really interesting because there are six characters. Three of them are female and three of them are male, which is great because so many games, you open it up. And I think, I think the reason I noticed it so much and I felt it so much is I'm in a household with three girls and two boys. And quite often what would happen was the two girls would get the two females usually also quite busty females which really annoys me like scantily clad for no good reason busty females and I'd have to be a boy because there weren't enough girl characters <laughs> just irritated just put more girls in so I would absolutely plead with you <laughs> in your game to make sure that it's diverse and it's inclusive one of my bugbears with this is so you've got three girls three boys great that's great and then you've got one black character, five white characters. It's just not representative. You want to play a character that looks like you, don't you? You want to play a character that, that represents you. So I think, you know, there are games, Subterra, I've mentioned before, is a cooperative game that I'll look at in one of the later sessions. Um, and that is really representative. I love, I love the characters in that. They've done a real good job. Um, it's just it's just much better but 
it's so common in gaming that if you didn't buy games because they weren't representative, you'd, you'd have about five board games. So, um, so anyway, um, so we've got seven different investigators, I should have said. Oh, I've just dropped all the pieces. <laughs> I've got them. <laughs> oh, dear me. Right, so... Um, one of the nice things about this game is the components in it are lovely. So it came with um, a standee. So that's just a little plastic base and just a cardboard cutout that you stand in. So it came with those. But because I'm a bit of a sucker and many, many people are. So if you're thinking marketing wise at some point, it also came with little plastic minifigures. And these, if you add minifigures to your game, for some reason, people are like, oh, I need that game. It's got little dolls. So I think in terms of kind of if you want to market your game at some point, I would definitely think about minis. I haven't painted these, but um, my partner's a massive Warhammer geek. <laughs> so at some point he's saying that he's going to paint them and they look beautiful once they're painted. So... Um, so this is Layla, and um, Layla is, like I was saying before about female characters, I like Layla because she's sensibly dressed for an adventure look. She's got her hair tied up, she's got a cap on, and she's carrying quite a sizable weapon. That's what you want when you're going on an adventure. So that's Layla. Um, and each character comes with a character board like this. And on the back of it, it's got a nice little story about your character so you can learn about your character and really get into your character. And then it's got spaces to put um, items that you gain as you go along your um, adventure, defensive items and uh, attack items. And these are just other, other items. And it's also got space for some, um, the 80s theme has been done really nicely in this one. It's really thematic. So it comes with little batteries, AA batteries, and you get three of those. And those basically you can use to, there's a few things you can do with them, but you only get three for the whole game. So it really makes your players think about how they're using them because you can use them to re-roll dice. You can use them to prevent yourself taking damage. But once they're gone, they're gone. And that's quite a nice thing sometimes in games to have something that goes out of the game and is done done with, you know. So that's that's quite nice. And then you've got little hearts, just little heart counters to show life. You also have um, like brain counters to show like your wits, basically. And once you run out of wits and health, you have fear, you are running on fear alone. And once your fear tokens run out, then you really are in trouble. So what they've done is you've got three kind of statuses. Oh no, four, sorry, what am I saying? Four status cards. So I don't know if you can see that. You've got like a heart monitor going along there and you've got a picture of Layla looking reasonably okay. And then on the last one, on the fourth one, you can see she's taken a bit of a battering, her heart rate struggling, and your abilities deplete as you go through. Once she loses all her hearts on this one, then she's frozen out for a while, and um, there's other kind of consequences of that. So you, you're basically trying to keep your character as healthy as possible. So you've got plenty of rungs to kind of fall down. <laughs> So, and your character comes with um, ability cards. Again, it's a bit more complex because it's got more abilities, not just one ability. You've got abilities that you can choose to use at set times, some abilities that you use once and you can't use again. And then she comes with a trash can lid to defend herself and some nunchucks. And then extra things you build up as you go through the game. So each character comes equipped on a very basic level and there's an, there's ways of upgrading. Like you can, there's a, in the story, sometimes you end up in a shop and when you go in the shop, you can buy some items. So it's kind of the, the getting more stuff is woven into the story. Okay. Um, 
also in terms of um, tokens and components, you get a little walkie talkie to show who the first player is. So you know what, you know when you've completed a round and that's, those kind of tokens are really useful if your game's quite complex. So if on my turn, I've got to do like four or five different actions and then we're going to pass on and then we're going to pass on and you want your players to do something at the end of a round, that's quite a lot to remember. So if we know that I went first, when it comes back round to me, we know that's the end of that round. So it kind of prompts us to do whatever it is you want to happen at the end of the round, whether that's to increase the difficulty, like I was saying before about picking, turning over event cards, that sort of thing. Okay. So, oh, more components. I'm gonna have to show you these as well. Also comes with uh, glow in the dark dice. The other thing that I'm a real sucker for, as well as minis, is dice, it's ridiculous. So they come with these little different symbols on and they've quite a clever little thing. The dice have got a direction on, a number and a symbol. So they're used in three different types of event. So they're used in battles. Um, and if you get a hit, that's a hit that, that damages the monster. They're used to show direction. So sometimes the dice will decide which direction you go. And they're also used as regular dice with the numbers at the top there. So that's quite a nice little design thing. I mean, I don't know, you know, what you're thinking of with your components, but, um, you know, there's ways of making different things. You know, if you want to kind of handcraft stuff, then there's all sorts of things you can do. This in particular is a really low kind of tech thing, but there's when you come up against events in the book, sometimes it says you've got to choose who's going to go or you've got to come to a consensus about like um, which which entrance we're going to go through. So we're going to go through A or B. So to do that, there's various ways of deciding. Sometimes it's the active player. So if it's my action, I make the decision. Other times they say you do um, you do a count of three, one, two, three, and you show which finger is like the number that corresponds with the option. So I pick option one, option two, option three, and then it's the person with the majority. The other way that you pick is sometimes one of you has to go forward and fight like a monster or, or you know, an animal or some something something horrible. And the way you choose that is you choose a matchstick. So there are some matchsticks and you hold them loosely and you get people to choose them. And these are literally just cardboard matchsticks, but they're different lengths. <laughs> so you, if you get the short matchstick, you're fighting the monster. And I think things like that are lovely because like the dice are quite technical and quite difficult, but things like this are so easy to make and just nice, you know, and it, it builds up that interaction in the group because obviously you are playing together, but sometimes you're like, I don't want to go. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, a kind of childlike thing, isn't it? During the shortest straw sort of thing. So, yeah. So, um, and the other thing that this game does, which I really like, is they have in it something called fusion events. So sometimes you go into a room and it tells you in the booklet that you have to put this little, this little symbol on it. And that means that you've been plunged into darkness, all the lights have gone out, okay? And it might say fusion event. And the fusion events, the idea is that you're in this game, this kind of horror game, and it, you've somehow brought it into your real life. So quite a lot of horror films and horror stories do that, like, you know, you close the door at the end and, oh, it turns out it was real. And in this, the idea is then it'll say, you've got a timer with it. It'll say, flip the timer. By the time the timer is out, you all have to have found some means of lighting the room. So it's torch, torch on your phone, candle. So everyone kind of runs around the room and tries to find the things that they can use. There's a really tricky one, which is um, you go into a room, the monster is sleeping, you can't wake the monster up, but it's a fusion event. So there can't be any sound at all while you're in that room. 
And that includes the dog barking, your phone ringing, someone knocking at your door. If any of those things happen, it, it prompts you to read a different event in the book and something bad happens. I don't know what the bad thing is because we've only played like three chapters of it. So we managed to get through without the dog barking and with no one knocking, but it was quite tense. You're thinking, I hope the postman doesn't come now. It's a really good way of getting people really into the game. So yeah, so the, um, it comes with two booklets. You can see my markers there, that's where we're up to. And this is the demon puppet mistress story. It actually comes with another story in this one as well. And this game, I think we sent you the link. They encourage you to make your own stories with the components and with the characters. And there's a website link, um, which I think you've got. And that means that you can then, if you want to go on, that'll give you a way of, of playing about with this game and creating a choose your own adventure with this game, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, um, and it works a bit like the other one um, in that you've got your, you've got your numbers there and it'll tell you like, um, so, say for instance, 319 says that place was really scary. And when we tried to look around, we realized that we were surrounded by a series of will o' the wisps that danced around us. And then it prompts you to put a piece of pizza on the board, because that means that there's something there to be found, a bit of <laughs> some kind of clue or other to be found. So one of your actions might be to pick that pizza up and then it'll it'll get you to pick up a card. Okay. Um I don't know what went through our heads, but a couple of half open coffins were there, apparently waiting for us. So now we were there. And at that point, better to take a look, right? We inspected a worn out coffin with a skeletal hand sticking out of it. Go to 177. Or we focused on a coffin that looked newer and closed properly. Go to 135. So then you would discuss it, try and make a decision. If you can't, reach consensus, you do your one, two, three. And uh, if you still can't reach a consensus, then <laughs> yeah, garlic would be, ah, uh... <laughs> oh, as you play in the dark, that would be a great idea. We don't, we haven't actually, but I think we should, we definitely should. So, so you pick and then you go to your next one. And it, so it's very traditional, like the choose your own adventure books, I'm going to say we used to have as kids. I don't know whether you did. I got one free on the Weetabix and it was like the best free thing I'd ever got. It's amazing. But um, but yeah, so that's that. Um, it's played over a number of chapters. So unlike Forest of Fate. Yeah, Haunted House one. Yeah. Unlike Forest of Fate, it's not one game and it's done. So you play and then you pause and then you I mean, you could play for like three or four hours if you wanted to. We've tended to play for an hour. Um, I think if you take your game much over an hour, I think you're affecting your audience there. And I think one of the things we want to think about is who your audience is, what age they are, how long they're going to want to sit and play a game for. Are they going to want 20 minutes at a time, in which case you can put it into blocks of time, like this one is blocked into hours. Um, so it's just something to be thinking about, really. The other really nice thing this book does, this game does, I should say, book game, uh, is the for the very first one, it, it teaches you. So your very first game takes an hour and you don't really, you don't really make any decisions or really play all that much, but it teaches you the game. So it takes you through each possible thing so like um, the second thing says, I knew I was right. And it says place one of these tokens on the board. And that means there's a break in the wall. So it uses in that example, it uses every single token, every single type of card. And it goes through all you'll need to know to play all the other chapters. So it kind of teaches you. But because of that, a lot of the decisions loop round you know how sometimes you think in your choose your own adventure book, you think, 
I'll go back and I'll try a different way and it still turns out the same. That's okay sometimes, but you don't want that all the time. The, the teaching version is kind of like that all the time. But having said that, I think that's really good because it's a really good way of learning it. Um, I just thought I would show you the board just so you can see. So that's the starting board. So that's where you start every adventure. It's like a hallway. And then there are doors leading off. So it'll tell you then, like it might be this board, it'll tell you which doorway to line it up with. And then you line up your doors. Um, you do also need quite a lot of space for this one. So, and it's double-sided as well. So they've made the most of their, you know, their printing there with that. Um, da, 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 da. I think I've told you everything about those two games. So um, does anyone have any questions about those two games or about, I've got some questions for you, <laughs> but I'll let you ask me questions first. I suppose I've got a question. Yeah. Um, so where would someone start? So they're quite, well, to me, quite complicated. Mm. Do you start with the story or the type of game you want to play? But kind of a, a beginner game designer, where would you start, do you think? Um, I think I would, it depends. It probably depends. I think I would probably start with like a character or a story that I wanted to tell. And then I would think about, how best I could make a game out of it. Some people they start with start with a game. They're like, oh, I want to make a game where you have to do this or where you are gonna, you know, take on a character. Or um, I know a person that I know on Facebook had come up with this idea of um, in Carcassonne. There's a little little piece called Meeples. And um, it's just like a little wooden person. But she'd got uh, mermaid shaped meeples, mermeeples. And she was literally so excited that she'd seen these mermeeples that she was like, now I have to make a game with mermaids. <laughs> and so that's how she made her game. So I think it can start anywhere you like. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah, the Usborne Adventure books, definitely. Uh, yeah, that would be a good starting point. Yeah, there are companies that make games and make one copy of games. Um, there are printers that you can use. Um, these ones are really professional. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be as slick as that. It's more about the experience, I think. The other example I was going to give you of people making games was a friend of mine um, is an illustrator and she drew loads of crazy characters that were just mixes of different animals and things. And they were pl literally playing around with these drawings, her and her friends. And um, they said that um, they would um, make noises for the animals, like, because they weren't real animals. So someone started making a noise for one of the animals and they were like, which one is it? And they were like, oh, you have to guess. And that became the game that you put five of these mixed up creatures on the table. And it, they're literally pieces of paper that she's drawn on. And then you can uh, you can guess then which one is which. But I will share some links with you. What I'll probably do is I'll get Claire to email some stuff out to you after the session. But I can share some links. I'm just looking to see where my box of stuff is. I can't see it. Um, I got a load of stuff from a company that was like blank cards and blank dice. Oh, they're there, look. So they were just blank cards that you could write on, but they look, they're like proper, do you know what I mean, a proper card. So even though you're just writing on them in Sharpie, it feels a bit more like a game, do you know what I mean? And they were quite, they were quite cheap. So they're quite a good starting point. So I'll link that company email if you do want to buy any bits. And then the die, what I did was, because um, my son made a game about making cakes, we just printed out on the printer on stickers, 
and then cut round them and stuck them on the dice. So it doesn't have to be like dead high tech, do you know what I mean? It's more about getting some ideas down and yeah. Ah, oh, prototypes and ideas. Cardboard Monopoly of Morley, brilliant. Brilliant. That's amazing. But yeah, those Osborne adventure books are good. Yeah. So I don't know whether I answered your question, Rihanna, just witted on. No, that's really useful. I think <laughs> it's just that um, I suppose if anyone has any ideas that they want to like bounce off each other or mm. um, but like what Claire was saying, we're not looking for kind of a complete game. It can just be some design ideas. Um, but yeah, and you can upload anything you like for the games jam. Um, but it'd be great if you want to use your expertise and knowledge to if you've got any ideas. But no pressure, we've got four weeks, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, oh we've got bags of time. So I was thinking there's some questions that I think it'd be quite useful to kind of think about. So I was thinking like one of the things I said at the beginning was often rule books start with a win condition. So maybe start to think about what winning would look like in your game. So, you know, what, what does that look like for you? What is winning? Is it that everyone wins? Is it that one person wins? You know, maybe have a little think about that. And maybe have a think then in a linked way about how easy it will be to win or how easy will it be to lose. So you're starting then to think about audience a little bit as well. Like, is your game for children? Is it for everyone? Is it for, you know, people who play games all the time? Is it for someone who's read that book or like fans of the book or is it for someone who's never read that book but you want to share the experience of that book with them? Like if you picked like The Hobbit or something, are you assuming that they've read it and seen films or that that you just love that book and you want them to experience the adventures that those characters went on? You know, so just some things to think about really. Um, yeah. Um, great questions to start off with then and I think um, from our point of view um, as judges um, we're looking for books uh, sort of for games that really inspire someone to read the book if they haven't or to enjoy the book in a new way um, so it could be that you're creating a whole new narrative of a character um, or something or a new ending to the story or something like that using the games um, so yeah, that's definitely what we're looking at. Yeah, you know, like if you've got people becoming the characters, then that might lead them on different paths than the characters in the actual book went on. You know, like those kind of alternative narratives you sometimes get. I read a poem about um, called it was called The Lady of Shalott, but it was by Elsa Corbleth, and it was it was about after like after everyone had assumed she was dead what really happened and she wasn't dead she was just really bored and it was just like just gives you a whole new perspective so you could do that you could do something like after the book or before the book or you know what I mean it doesn't have to be like bang on the book and I also really love the different little elements like the matchsticks and the batteries and stuff so you could focus in on what's in the book and create those um, little kind of tools and things. I thought that was really lovely and really hands-on. Um, immersive, isn't it? Then, like when you play this game, you're really in the eighties. Do you know what I mean? With the little, like those little battery details, and yeah, and that can be captured through like illustration or or components or whatever. You know, whatever you. Want. Yeah, and you could use some of our Flickr collection images that Rianne's put together as well. Um, those are copyright free, I think, aren't they, Rianne? Yes, you could just use them. And if anyone's got any ideas that we haven't got images for, then you can send us an email and I can trawl through some of our library shelves and get more images. Uh, but I think we've got a question, haven't we, about whether the game has to relate to one of the 100 novels? No, well, ideally, yes, but because they're all in these different themes, 
it can be quite broad. So we're looking at adventure, rule breakers, crime and conflict and life, death and other worlds. And so I think if there's some sort of link to those themes or, um, or maybe set in 19th century England. So you've got that kind of Dickens kind of theme to it. Um, but we're really quite open, aren't we? And that's kind of how our judging criteria is going to work. So is it going to make me pick up a book and a story? Oh, yeah, and Izzy's oh, just saying about lots of copyright free stuff that people can access. So I think we'll probably start, we will have like a Facebook group where we can share some ideas. Um, so we can start putting lots of kind of links and things there too. That's really cool, yeah. Anyone else? I think everyone's got a lot to think about, haven't they? Are people fancying the idea of a cooperative game then, or what are people thinking? Feel free to take yourselves off mute if you're okay yeah, being recorded. Fine. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> I hate cooperative games. That's fair enough. That is fair enough. Because there isn't an overall winner. Why why do you hate them, Tom Van? Oh no. Well, what winds up happening is that one strong personality winds up taking over the game and basically telling everybody what to choose. And it gets me so peed off that I just like, I have a very hard time playing them at all. Um, yeah. But, uh, or, or I'll try to undermine the goals just to be fractious. But basically I, I feel like uh the, the it is difficult for it's it winds up not being truly cooperative yeah. and it's just like if you just want to be all four people then why don't you just sit at home and play it by yourself um yeah, you and, it, yeah. and, I, and i play games enough that it's really irritating to have somebody else constantly telling me what to pick it's like i want to learn you know give me the opportunity i mean frankly i thought having all of us try to pick which one of the elements to use um against the wolves was more cooperative than you know half the games i've played with other players yeah well um i ran a cooperative game online and um i have a lady who comes to my events who's autistic and she's always she doesn't like um cooperative games generally uh, for similar reasons actually she feels like she doesn't actually get the thinking time that people just talk at her so she can't process it because everyone's going oh why don't you do this why don't you do that and she's like I'm trying to think I'm trying to focus on my thoughts so when we did it online of course because you were only off mute when it was your turn to talk oh. she didn't she found it much better because it was like right now you can say so when it was your turn you did have a discussion, but it was a more structured discussion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it worked, it worked better, actually. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> I get, I do get what you mean. Have you ever played Magic Maze? Has anyone ever that one I love. That one I, I love. I say, because that, the people who hate that are sometimes those alpha players who are like, well, I couldn't make everybody do. So just to explain to people, Magic Maze is played in silence. So it's a cooperative game, but you're not allowed to talk. What you have is a big red. It's called the do something pawn, isn't it? And you can put that in front of the person who you want them to do something, but you can't tell them and you can't point at them. And in our house, you're also not allowed to bang it on the table in front of them. <laughs> Place it non-aggressively on the table in front of you and let them work out. But obviously, if you've got a very fixed idea of what you want to do, you keep putting the pawn there and they're like, oh, no, I'm going around this way. And they carry on doing what they're doing. That gets people angry, but for different reasons. People get angry because they can't make everybody do it their way. So people who, like, like you say, who hate cooperative games for that reason, that, yeah, that's a good one for them, actually. That's really interesting that you love it. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, could I, could, I, could um, I ask if you have, sorry, Anne, I mean, um, you've got any examples of uh, cooperative games aimed at younger age groups? I was in Germany many years ago, and the first time I saw a shop that was advertised as selling cooperative games. Ah. The trouble was they were, they were all in German, and my German wasn't good enough to sort of work out 
quite what level they were aiming at or how easy they were to play. But there must be yeah. someone around, but I, I don't know where to go to look at good examples. Um, so, I'm not being rude, I'm just getting you something. Um, this one's really good. Flatter. Um, oh, I'm back on my wheelie chair. This one is called Outfoxed. Yeah. It's really cute. Have you seen it before? I haven't, no, no. So it's Any, age... Anything you can recommend, I, I, I'd it's welcome really it. good. So it's age five plus. And the story is the fox has stolen the pie. Um, and it's a little bit guess who. So you've got to work out which fox stole the pie and then you've got to stop him getting to his um, burrow at the end. Is it a burrow? Set. Oh. Foxhole. Uh. Um, so to do that, you've got to work out which fox it is. And so it'll say like the fox that stole the pie hasn't got a hat on, but they are wearing pearls and they have got a flower in their lapel. So you gradually deduce which fox stole the pie and it's just lovely. And it's got a little, me and my figures, it's got a little orange plastic fox in, which is really cute. So that's a brilliant one. And someone's just said zombie kids. That's good too. Yeah, that's a really good one. And SOS Dino is a nice one where there's um, four dinosaurs and you have to work together to get them onto the hills, the high mountains, away from the volcanoes to save them. And that's really cute. And that's like, I think that's seven and up. So right. yeah. Thank yeah. you. I hope that helps. <laughs> so what, what do other people think? Someone else said they love co-ops. Ellie, you love them. And Nicole, you love them. That's good. So might you make a co-op game? maybe. And <laughs> um, what I was going to show you just briefly was, and I, again, I can email this out to people. Um, one of the difficult things I think with Choose Your Own Adventure is um, like planning it all because it's, it's, it's like planning a book, but also planning like, a, um, sorry, let me just find it yeah it's also like planning like a variety of I don't know of novels really because you've got all the different strands the way I personally would plan it is I would get like a big roll of wallpaper you know the and on the back of it I would write the main thing on there and I would just use post-it notes so that I can move things I'm very tactile with my planning so I'm a fan of big sheets of sugar paper and markers do you know what I mean but there are other ways and um, someone recently recommended twine to me I don't know that one but apparently that's quite a good way of planning it um I'll just share my screen with you she says will I though uh just bear with sorry <laughs> let me find it now Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So if I click that. So what I did was I did on um, draw, uh, draw IO, or it might be flowchart IO. And this is, so this is what we did. So we did, you are surrounded by wolves and there were four choices. So you had guile, speed, care, or force. We chose guile picked up earth to throw if you've got fair or good that's what would have happened if you've got great in that skill that's what that's what could happen and if you're epic oh I read the wrong one didn't I <laughs> I gave us epic skill that was generous we should have lost four life and become panicked oh well we're very brave as the leader pounces you throw the dust they retreat so, and then you do it for each one. The nice thing about the structure of Forest of Fate is you can see that's one complete thing. Do you know what I mean? That, that is one complete adventure. The other book would be much harder to do because, so I didn't do, I just did a general one. So scenario one would be you discover a wardrobe which has a doorway hidden at the back. 
So you've got four, three choices. The third choice, nothing happens, revisit 1A or 1B the next day. If you go through the door, I, what I would do if it was me planning it is I would follow one track as far as I could think of, as far as the ideas that I had. And then I'd go back and I'd do another track. And I would just do that, just do it one at a time. So you're not trying to hold four separate novels in your head. Do you know, well, not novels, but you know what I mean, like storylines. So, so that's that one. And um, someone's just asking, are you okay to circulate that diagram? Yeah, that's what I, what I thought was. I would, I've done a little list of questions to think about and I've done those two flow charts. So I'll share those and I'll add to that the list of um, where to get games printed. Yeah. Let me just, can I not share my screen now? Yes, stop share. Ta-da! Oh, Nicole, I feel your pain. My 12-year-old wins at everything. My son beats me at everything. Absolutely everything. It's painful. Don't even let him. Like, sometimes I pretend I have just to save face. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's good for you to win. It's like boost your confidence. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it does prevent if you've got one competitive child and one non-competitive, I think it definitely helps with fighting. Um, that, um, that zombie kids, Rachel, might be good for seven plus. I think that might be a good one if they're into that sort of thing. Or if they like dinosaurs, that dino SOS is a good one. Oh, semi-co-op games. Alice, I don't know that much about semi-cooperative games, actually. Which ones are you well, thinking Well, no, I of? mean, in terms of we sometimes help the youngest one with some of her decision-making to sort of help her learn the game and to learn yeah. to strategize as we go. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've done that, or kind of gone on a little team sort of thing. Yeah. I'll tell you one that is, is on paper too hard for that age group I think it's age 10 or 11 up is Forbidden Island and Forbidden Island you crash land on an island and then you have to collect your treasure and then you have to escape and that's cooperative and yeah, um we have that one we haven't tried it with three yet we might uh, actually yeah it's I Forbidden think Sky that we didn't get on with at all Forbidden Sky yeah the most recent one so hard yeah but the spaceship so yeah, it's got, it's got, hasn't it? You, in Forbidden Sky, you're on a, a space a platform in, in the sky and you're trying to rebuild your rocket and escape, but it creates an actual electrical circuit. And then the little rocket, I know if you do it right, the little rocket take like makes the kind of three, two, one noise and lights up. It's amazing, but uh, I've never won it. I've played it loads. It's so, it's like the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> You know what I'm saying about the lose conditions in cooperative games? In Forbidden Sky, you lose if the wind blows you off your platform. You lose if you get electrocuted. You lose if any one of you dies. And you lose if you run out of rope. Yeah. yeah. There was a pandemic game, I think, that's set on an aeroplane, which we tried once at a games cafe, and it was so stressful. <laughs> you've got a timer, which you've got to think up what you're doing, and then it's the next person, and we, we just we just completely lost it. To be honest, I can't deal with timers. I can't, I can't <laughs> deal with them at all. Like, I'll play the game, not with the timer. Pass the bomb is one of the worst ones. It's just a word game. You've got to think of words, and then you pass the bomb on. And like people hand it to you and you're like, I don't know any words, <laughs> none, none at all. Ah, like, <laughs> it's hopeless. Oh. <laughs> Can you advise, because um, some games, they're like, you play it and it's over in an hour, but the mm. other games, they take forever, don't they? And you come back to them. Can you advise on any, like are there stages where you say, right, you've ended this bit, come back at this bit or like page marks or that kind of thing? 
Yeah, so in that Tales of Evil one, they recommend that you uh, that you actually write in the booklet. So, I mean, you could build that in. You could leave space for people to write a note in. I've used, like, post-it notes in mine. Um, and also some boxes, this is quite comical, actually. I can't show you because <laughs> the box came with, like, a save system. So the box came with, like, labels, apparently, inserts where you could put like these are the cards we've used this game these are the cards that we haven't used yet we unpacked the game and we were like oh we're never going to get it back in the box with that bit of plastic in binned the plastic yeah about three weeks later we got it out and played it and we were like at the end of the game it was like pack it away in this order and we we're like oh we can't pack it away in that so we just <laughs> went and got loads of little bags and then wrote on them with Sharpie. Like I said, very low tech in our house. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there are ways that you can, you can make it that it ends at the end of a chapter or that, you know, yeah, yeah. You could build in pauses into it, couldn't you? Yeah. I've got another question. <laughs> Pendulum. Quite sorry, I've just seen that pendulum comment. That sounds horrific. <laughs> it's awful. It's it. Uh, I don't know even how you describe it, but there's just three different egg timers. I think one's three minutes, one's two minutes, and one's forty-five seconds. And you have to just keep making decisions, and people keep flipping the timers. And it's absolutely. I was completely stressed at the end of it. It was awful. I've, I've said I'm never playing it again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten my question now, Anne. <laughs> it's me, I talk too much. No, I was getting carried away, you see. I love all of <laughs> Yeah, this is fantastic. It's so great to like share everyone's experiences and different ways you play as well. Um, and I've learned a lot. Um, I want to now buy two or three of the games that you talked to spoken about especially the rocket one which creates a circuit into that it's a bit of like stem really isn't it yeah yeah it's true actually yeah Still learning, isn't it? is it worth doing a bit of a teaser for next week uh yeah sure so i'm oh, uh, really excited <laughs> yeah so next week if you're joining us for the next one, it is, um, oh yeah, it's Life, Death and Other Worlds. So um, we're looking at a game called And Then We Died, which is, um, it's a beautifully illustrated game on tarot cards. Um, and I've had an idea actually to email a card each out in advance so that we can start with a little game of it. It's a really, it's a really nice little game. Um, and that one plays one, two, about eight people, they say, but you can play with, well, we're going to play with however many people we've got, aren't we? But um, yeah, so you can play like, um, you can play it on your own. And it's just about writing stories with the cards. So that's a really nice one. And we're going to look at Dixit as well. I don't know any of you know Dixit. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like the artwork's beautiful. Yeah, Dan's nodding. There's lots of people nodding. <laughs> so that's a really beautiful one. And again, that's one that you could kind of um, you could kind of make really that kind those kind of cards. You know that kind of game. And we're going to look at in terms of mechanic. We're going to look at that voting mechanic that Dixit uses. That um, the dreadful cards against humanity has popularized. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's an interesting little mechanic to use. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to yeah learning about those. That sounds fantastic. Ooh, so I didn't know that about that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's it's really it's a really simple game to to start off with, and then as you play it, there's a little stack of envelopes in there, and you they have new pieces in them and new rules and new baddies. It's really cool. Our boys absolutely love it. So we've just got the new one, which is Zombie Teens, and that's really good as well. Ah, cool. Yeah. Oh, that does sound good. Um, which one do you mean is a bit like Flux? And and then we died. 
sorry, now in terms of the sort of new rules and elements to the game. Ah, yes. Have you played Flux, Nicole? Yeah, we've got Flux. Flux is Flux is a bit different in that the rules change as you're going along. So depending on what I can't we haven't played it for ages, but I think depending on what cards you've got in play or what tiles you've got in play, I think the rules change and then you're just getting close to achieving something and then they change again and it's really frustrating but fun. Yeah, it can be, it's it's one of the games. I did a, a session of games with some um autistic children at my son's school. And um that's one of the games I took in because I think it's it's quite it's fun because it's I've got the zombie one and so kids want to play it but that 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 switching and changing is quite challenging so it's quite an interesting one to have a go at and talk about how you feel about things changing quite suddenly and it was it was an interesting one so if, if you don't know flux it's um a card game and you have goals in it that you're supposed to achieve but those goals are set by you playing a goal card down onto the table so at any moment, someone from their hand can go, oh, I'm just going to change the goal. Um, and then it changes it. And they can also play new rule cards, which can make you discard cards or pick up extra cards or play extra cards on your turn. So all three of those things change and flux constantly through the game. The amount of cards you can play, the amount you can pick up and the 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 outcome. So... Yeah, it can be. It can be a bit annoying. <laughs> is um, is zombie kids? When it, uh, does it require you to believe, or to believe sublimely or otherwise, in the existence of zombies? If so, I'm wondering what it does to kids' minds. Um, it's very tame and cute. <laughs> My kids have always been quite ghoulish and liked all that kind of Halloween stuff, so they were never bothered by that. No, no, I was, I was just, just wondering whether... It, um, yeah. It, no, it's an interesting question. I think it's interesting, yeah. If, if people do like Flux, the other one that I've got that's a little bit similar is called We Didn't Play Test This At All, and it's just like chaos. You only start with two cards and you play a card and pick up each turn. And it's one of the cards is I win. And you play the card and you've won and the game's <laughs> So sometimes the game lasts a minute and sometimes it lasts much longer. There's one card that says presence and the other person has to say yes or no, or the other people. And one of the presents, if you say yes, it's a box of snakes, you die. So you're all out. So only the people who said no are left. And the other one is, um, I think it's chocolate cake. So if you said no, you're a fool and you're out. <laughs> so it's like just complete chaos. That, that's a cooperative game, is it? No, that one's a co that's a competitive right. one, but it's just really daft. So it, it's one that you almost don't mind losing because there's no skill involved. <laughs> it's just stupid, do you know what I mean? So my, my children used to find that very funny because it was so silly. And so arbitrary, like they used to both find it hilarious. So just thinking if some people enjoy Flux, they might also enjoy that one. So Victor's saying Chrononauts, I don't know that one. Is that a timeline type one? Uh, yeah, so uh, basically you, there, is, there is a timeline uh, which is laid out um, on the table uh, in a sort, of, sort of like a grid of cards. Um, but it and, and, and then basically you play various uh, actions or items to affect the timeline to get it to what your win condition is. Um, you can also collect items, things like uh, the fake Mona Lisa, the convincing Mona Lisa, the real Mona Lisa. Um, but uh, a house rule that we play with, which makes it fun, is that uh, whenever you change the timeline, you need to narrate how and why you change it. Uh, and then if somebody then wants to change it back, then they need to incorporate your story in their story. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly old game, I think, at this point. I might be out of print, uh, but it's, again, like a fun, silly card game. Oh, that sounds really nice. Is, has everybody got a different objective then? 
Uh, yes, so you start off with uh, random different objectives. So, for example, it can be collect the fossils of five dinosaurs uh, and then you win. Or have these events happen in that particular order. Right. That sounds really good. Oh, yeah, you just said each person has two objectives. Cool. Um, chrononauts, I'm writing that down. Because <laughs> I have not heard of that. <laughs> Sounds quite brutal. I like a brutal game. <laughs> well, I think we're coming up to the end of our session. So do you want to leave it there, Anne, and leave people wanting more?